Okay, good morning, Dr. Adriana Bankston. Thank you for uh, visiting us again today at Georgia Connect College. And um, everyone's familiar with Dr. Bankston because she was here before, um, taking us through journal clubs, the, our journal club on science policy analysis. And so today she's going to lecture for us um, on how to write an effective science memo um, because the goal is that based on all of the legislative research you guys have been doing for the entire semester, um, we want to crown it all with uh, crafting a science policy memo of you. And, and the ultimate goal would be to have that received and accepted and published in the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, um, of which Dr. Bangston is the Chief Outreach Officer. So I hope you have um, good questions that she can ask you as a, um, a professional in legislative analysis. So with that, Dr. Banston, thank you for being here and I will allow you to share your slide. Great, let's see. So, full screen. All right. Great. So, thanks for um, having me back. It's been uh, enjoyable talking to students over the last couple of months um, on these issues, and there's a lot of interest in policy training. So, it's a good time to, to be doing this during COVID, too. So um, I have a few slides on sort of general principles on memos, and then I'll go into the paper uh, from Sarah Benenge as an example. So starting with this diagram, you've probably seen this before, uh, and you know that academic writing is very much starting with the background, followed by supporting details, conclusions, etc. And writing policy starts uh, sort of the flips the pyramid in that you'd start with the bottom line, answer the question of what, so what, why do I care? And then you add the details. Um, so this is essentially the uh, flipped argument from the way that you would write an academic paper um, and applies to the public as well as policymakers. So um, I think I've told you a little bit about communication before, but just to reiterate that policy writing is very different to want to think about. Um, these are good general principles and will apply to your memo specifically because of the way that uh, memos are being done. Um, but generally you wanna think about who you're writing to and not just who is your audience, but in the more larger context in terms of being aware of what current issues exist around the topic that you're interested in, who's engaged in them. So knowing more about the political landscape as well as how you can frame some actionable solutions to problems that your audience might have. Uh, and frame these based on the constituency. So policymakers, uh, you know, want to hear from their constituents, but um, you want to know their background and their interest in the issue. The second is, what is your message that you want to send to your particular audience? So again, the way that you frame this will depend on who you're talking to. And you, your message needs to be both accessible, relatable, and meaningful, and really, as again, answer the question of why should I care about this topic? So again, very high level. And finally, the mediums, so obviously you're writing here, but um, different ways of communicating to policymakers will be, be effective. Uh, again, emphasizing that this is your message and your audience, and so it will be very specific to your particular situation. So I can tell you from my uh, role at UC and others that about 85% of my job is writing. And so it's important to learn some of these principles here. Um, for memos and, and broader as well. So when writing policy, you wanna be using active verbs. So active verbs obviously convey a certain tone of leadership and responsibility. You can use analogies and examples that help you better relate to your audience, um, as well as you wanna avoid jargon, um, euphemisms, cliches, word plays and puns, etc. cetera. Um, so it's very straightforward and should be very cl clear what you're trying to say. Um, you want to include only details that are critical to your story. So I think this is important because a lot of times scientists want to put all the background that they can in there. And um, it's important to think about what is relevant for them to know and just um, present that to them. 
and you want it to be um, evidence based and true to the facts. And so obviously, um, this is important in communicating to policymakers in an evidence based manner. And um, finally, you will be obviously revising as you probably have done, um, you know, be ready to revise, rewrite and, and uh, revise again. Uh, the only way to learn policy is to edit and practice. Um, so there's be a lot, a lot of drafts in the process. And finally, cite your sources. Um, so this is maybe less relevant to memos because you wouldn't actually write the sources in there, but um, knowing where um, to get your research from and information um, is important and you wanna have that um, documented as well. So um, the memo, okay, so actually you can't see this because I have, there we go. Um, so um, this is, I showed you this table before, the different types of writing that we publish in JSPG, but these are pretty common um, write-ups for uh, policy anyway. Um, and so I went through this before, there's different types, different lengths, etc. cetera. Uh, some of these uh, make an argument, some of them are more balanced. And so I talked about policy analysis last time. And then memos specifically, which are highlighted here, um, should be about 2000 words back. So it maybe comes out to maybe a page and a half um, or one page, ideally, if you can. Um, you uh, Memos provide analysis and recommendations for a particular audience, again, regarding a particular situation and problem. So it's very specific to that case. So it, it will be important to define what the problem is that you're talking about and who it's for. And so a lot of times you'll be doing this, maybe you could even do it internally within an organization, you're directing it to a specific individual um, <clears throat> and would have also an executive summary, which uh, you've seen that in the paper, but that's uh, more academic, but you would normally do that um, as well. Whether you're in policy or not, that's kind of a good um, strategy for memos generally. So we can start with um, some basics. Mm, so as I, as I described the policy analysis before, basically the same uh, idea here. So who writes memos and what are they for? Um, so they're written by policy advisors, advocates, and everyday citizens who are seeking to affect change in their community. So it's pretty broad. Um, they're usually pretty straightforward, um, concise documents that analyze an issue and offer recommendations to inform and guide a decision maker. And so the thing to note here is that uh, policymakers have a lot, you know, a finite amount of time. Um, so having a concise and straightforward presentation of your information is essential because they won't have time to read long documents. Uh, so they need to be able to understand what you're saying from uh, your uh, one page. Um, and so in that um, respect, you wanna communicate only the essential information that they need to know uh, quickly, that they can skim quickly and understand clearly what you're saying. And uh, <clears throat> based on this, uh, what it says here is that you want to basically use it as a vehicle to persuade them to act on a particular issue in a certain way. And they're mostly written for individuals who are uninformed but intelligent readers, not policy wonks. And so it'll be, um, this will be important when you're writing to remember that um, they may not be as familiar with the topic, uh, but they um, should be able to understand as an intelligent audience. Um, so readers of policy memos include uh, politicians, lobbyists, non-governmental organizations, community leaders, and public initiatives. So it's really, again, pretty broad uh, between the public policymakers and others as well. Sorry, my computer's trying to do something here. Okay. Um, all right. So next, uh, this is covering it again. Let me put this down. We can see the screen clearly. I don't know. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, um, right. So now you know a little bit about the basics. Um, so I want to now talk about um, more a sort of broader context of putting your memo in the context of what's going on politically. You want to ask yourself why you're writing this. So what is justification and the need that this memo is filling? Um, whom do you represent? So who are you writing this as? And then in terms of a larger context, you want to do your research, 
on prior legislation, um, what is prior legislation on this topic looks like, um, what do you propose, and has that, that been done before or is it new? So I'm going to be familiar with the, the background on that issue. You want to think about how funding should be allocated to accomplish your recommendations. And more broadly, again, what is the political context under which you're writing this? And thinking about these factors beforehand will make it easier, um, more likely that your memo will achieve the goals that you want it to. And you can see the structure here. Um, <clears throat> so the structure obviously is also critical to the success of your memo, especially in terms of clarity and conciseness. And then um, the um, structure here. Um, so as I mentioned, you want to start with the bottom line up front. Um, you can present your takeaway message right at the top so they, they can see that. This will be followed by um, relevant and concise background. Again, don't give all the background that you have, only what is needed in order for them to understand and bring them up to speed uh, on the issue um, as briefly as you can. But again, explaining what the issue is and the significance um, to the reader. And the more direct the significance is, the more effective your memo will be. So again, knowing who you're talking to and what their stance might be on this. Uh, next, you want to define your argument through relevant dimensions. So um, this means that in, this, in addition to being evidence-based, other dimensions um, should be taken into consideration as well. And we'll, I'll cover this um, towards the end in terms of um, <clears throat> different things to consider. And then it's also important that um, you not only state your recommendations um, at the end, but also that they're clear and that you provide a specific blueprint and policy roadmap for implementing them. Um, so um, not all memos will do that, but in principle, and I think especially for teaching and, and training and learning how to write this, it's important to take the next step and think about, okay, now what, what, what would I do with these recommendations? And if I, that happens in the real, real world, that your um, policymaker would actually read it, you would actually want them to take an action with those recommendations and um, thinking about the next steps from there. So um, some factors to consider in terms of um, <clears throat> writing, tone, etc. cetera. Um, so these are all more um, considerations for writing a memo that is effective. Um, so you want to have a tone that is neutral and straightforward. You want to use active voice, as I mentioned. Uh, this suggests that you have a, there's an ongoing problem and also conveys a sense of urgency. You want it to be brief, again, so the reader can understand what the main points are quickly, as well as objectivity. So you need to show both the positive and negative outcomes of your proposed recommendations, or at least even if you're making an argument, be aware of what the counter argument is um, and might be, and that's very likely to come up. The audience obviously should be able to easily understand how the information that you present is translatable into concrete policy decisions. And your memo should be concise, so the argument needs to be very succinct with, uh, without unnecessary details. And it needs to be substantiated by credible findings and evidence, so again, data and evidence-based writing. And finally, you should consider the political palatability because policy memos um, often pertain to political issues. So it's important to consider the political positions of your readers um, and how they might respond to your recommendations. So here's a structure. Um, um, as I mentioned, the, in um, the real world, you would actually direct a memo to a specific recommendation. So obviously JSPG isn't written that way, but you would consider um, you know, to write specifically who it's from, who it's for, if it's a specific representative, um, that's, that's um, helpful. And again, understanding their background. So you would be writing towards um, specific individuals or organizations or particular decision makers. And um, your memo would have the header, which is to front, who is it from, who is it for, um, typically have a summary at the top, and then um, sort of follow a structure of what do we know, what do we recommend, what are the limitations of this study, and what are the barriers to that policy and conclusions. So the background here in red um, is, um, this is sort of the, um, I guess correlating with the Benish paper now, transitioning into that. And so the, if you've read the paper, you'll see that um, 
she she does a really nice job of I think laying out these, these different sections and which I think is it's a good example to teach on because uh, it's pretty straightforward and what she's asking for. Um, so in relation to this um, structure here, the the way that she <clears throat> she writes it is that um, starting with a problem, um, what the issues are, the context um, in which this is written opportunities for growth and then recommendations coming out of that and that um, this landscape provides opportunities to uh, improve and recommend different policies and then conclusions. So in um, in her paper, um, I'm just here, I'm just showing you the executive summary to illustrate some of these, um, the structure here. So um, the background is that uh, the United States has been a leader in science, technology, engineering and math. Um, for a long time. Um, and there are a lot of, uh, you know, there's 1 million more STEM professionals that need to go into the workforce. And the context is that in order to produce um, STEM graduates, we need to um, have more individuals from diverse backgrounds um, in academia and prepare them to uh, be successful after, um, after they graduate um, in the workforce. And so uh, obviously the argument is going to be for diversity. Um, the recommendations are that um, sort of three, three, threefold, um, advocating for a change in paid parental leave, uh, investing in programs that encourage STEM for all approach and providing greater financial uh, resources for min minority students. So these are very specific. So you can see even though she starts with um, this broad, broad question of how do we maintain the US as a leader in this field? How do we increase diversity? But then the recommendations that she wants are very specific and directed again um, to specific stakeholders that would act on them. So this is um, the sort of a good general structure, I think, um, to look at and um, follow this for your writing too. So just going through her, um, her paper now um, to sort of frame this story. Um, so it starts with the problem. So obviously higher education drives the US economy. However, there are barriers in higher education for many racial and ethnic, ethnic groups in STEM. Some of the examples um, that are given is their longer graduation rates, those lower retention, and many students feel unprepared to pursue STEM degrees. So even though um, the US is still considered at the top of um, education, um, there's obviously this diversity issue that we're not training um, all the groups that we could or we should be training. And so some ways to overcome this potentially is to promote a sense of belonging and more education for these students and diversifying the workforce. And she focuses specifically on women, underrepresented minorities and individuals with disabilities. Obviously these are one type of um, diversity that is important and um, is addressed here. So the context then is that um, we know that education in the US is valuable, leads to highly skilled workforce. However, in the last few years, education has leveled off and that there are fewer individuals completing their degrees. And this, a lot of um, this has led to the US actually, education in the US actually lagging behind um, other countries who actually invest more in their education and training like China and others. Um, and this is um, a prob problem because um, we will need more jobs in the workforce and um, a lot of um, this is going to require higher education training. So a lot more positions now require uh, this sort of training that again, we're not giving to everyone that we could. And so we need students from all backgrounds in STEM um, to meet these demands, but also give them opportunities for education. So this landscape of um, lack of diversity actually provides opportunities to improve. Um, again, the workforce diversity is lacking um, in many groups and they're not uh, present in different sectors. So Brookings Institute published a paper saying that 22% of STEM workers are women, 10% are Asian, 6% black, 9% Hispanic. And uh, data from the NSF show that students with disabilities are less likely to enroll in STEM graduate studies. And so again, focusing on these groups, um, it's really, this is where uh, we need, there's more work to do. 
but as I said, this continued uh, underrepresentation of minorities and women in STEM um, is an opportunity for us to cultivate a more diverse workforce. So how do we how do we do that? The last couple of sections here. Then what do we recommend? How we might actually act on this? So um, we two two things um, to entice students is that we want to give them a strong foundation in STEM education, but also get them excited about the field and how they might use this knowledge when they graduate. Right. So it's important to have role models and um, get them in, into science early if possible. Um, these three recommendations here, um, or three areas to address, I guess, um, related to not just students, but also outside. So one is ensuring a STEM literate constituency. So it's important to, um, for citizens to understand science and technology because that's helpful for their day-to-day -day life. You wanna cultivate a STEM proficient workforce. So this is what we've been talking about, um, education that produces more skilled workers to enter the workforce as well as cutting off the achievement gap. And so this is, uh, you know, again, being able to recognize what talent might be out there that we're not, not reaching out to, uh, manage and properly compensate them. Uh, again, a lot of times students from underrepresented groups may not think about applying to these programs. And so how do we um, overcome that gap? So policy suggestions, uh, as I mentioned, um, again, this is interesting because um, it sort of covers three areas. So one is legislation, um, the other one is programs, and the last one is finances. And all of these things are different ways to, to impact policy. Um, and there's a specific way to, um, you know, paid parental leave obviously would be helpful, equal pay, um, as well as programs that encourage all students to join. And uh, again, more financial resources for minority students. And there's a lot of push for uh, grants for um, URNs and so on. So this is interesting. Yeah, I think because um, it's very relevant to real world policy and then ways that you might actually impact it uh, in three different ways. So this is um, <clears throat> sort of the, um, the paper itself. So hopefully that was a helpful overview. Um, the last few slides here, uh, I just want to go through a few more dimensions that I mentioned in the beginning um, related to what else to think about other than being clear and concise and following the structure. There are a lot of other considerations. Think about, again, within the political landscape, how do I write a memo that is effective and impactful? So um, the first thing to consider here, one thing is explicit transparency. So you wanna be straightforward also about the limitations that you have when framing your argument and recommendations. Again, even though you're making an argument, you wanna understand the other side of it too. Uh, this transparency can be based on initial cost benefit analysis, which is a summary analysis of the costs and benefits of each recommendation that you're making. This analysis can provide useful criteria to assess uh, the likelihood of success. Um, or failure of your recommendation and can also be used when summarizing the differences between your recommendations and alternative policy options. So they might ask you why is this the best option um, compared to others. And then finally, this analysis can also help you assess the practicality and feasibility of your recommendations. The next consideration is doing a stakeholder analysis. So where this is where you would assess the impact of um, your recommendations on different stakeholders in the community and keeping in mind, again, the views of the major political players that might um, and how they might react to, to your recommendation. Would they be against it? Um, what is their background in the, on the issue? And so you want to frame your recommendations within the current political landscape and also consider how these political players might react. Uh, <clears throat> the next one is a social impact analysis. So this refers to examining the broader social consequences of your recommendations. For the most part, you need to be able to explain um, how your recommendations actually address the problem and what the broader implications might be. And this will entail uh, very concrete suggestions and also explaining again why one option is better than another uh, relating to um, societal impact. In addition to these broader considerations, you need to think about feasibility of your recommendations. So um, this might be in different contexts. Um, again, whether it is politically feasible, operationally feasible, and financially feasible. So it's okay if there's, uh, you know, you have a radical idea 
but it must be realistic and also doable based on um, these criteria, as well as again, in the broader political context. And the last um, <clears throat> consideration here is how do we write, um, think about inclusive communication when we're writing policy? So this is interesting and um, you know, really important and relevant. Um, this is only a part of this. So I think there's a lot more that you can read about and how to, how to make sure that you are being inclusive when you're writing. But um, one thing to consider, so you wanna be people centric. So this focuses on the person and reflects on their individuality and does not uh, classify or stereotype the person based on their association or identity with a certain group or culture. You wanna have a strength based approach. And so this means focusing on abilities, knowledge and capacities of people and assuming positive things rather than a deficit approach as related to individuals. Um, you might also want to use terms that are um, defined by the community. So um, your each group or sort of um, policy community has terms that are um, well known in that um, community and are widely used. And so you want to know what they are and uh, they might mean different things depending on who you're talking to. And again, and also you want to write for a global audience. So again, keeping in mind sort of the broader applicability and accessibility of your writing. And so you don't necessarily want to be too culturally sensitive to only the US. And then on the flip side, you don't want to use, um, so I think some of this is probably um, common sense, but um, you don't want to use language that shows prejudice, stereotyped or discriminatory views of particular people or groups. You also don't want to write with unnecessarily gendered language, so as not to assign particular genders to a person uh, or assuming that it's only one gender. So one example would be, Instead of saying mailman, you would say mail carrier, things like that. Um, pronouns can also go in here in terms of not using gender specific pronouns unless the person you're referring to is actually that gender. And then um, you don't want to employ socially charged terms for technical concepts. So what does that mean? Um, you don't want to um, think about individuals in divisive ways. So for example, avoid terms. So if you, when you say native, native speaker, first class citizen, for example, although these terms are widely used, but they can be misinterpreted. So, and again, depending on how the, the context of writing looks like. Um, so for example, instead of saying native, you could say built in to describe a feature that's part of a product. Uh, instead of saying first class, you could say um, something is essential. Uh, part of a core or product, et cetera, because um, these words might be interpreted differently depending on who is reading them. And finally, you don't want to um, use um, ableist language. So this is common, uh, may be common to, to do without realizing it. Um, ableism is defined as systematic, institutional um, devaluing of bodies and minds, uh, deemed deviant, abnormal, defective, subhuman, less than, et cetera. So this includes words like um, crazy, insane, crippled, dumb, and others, uh, which again, can be very sensitive. Um, so one example is uh, instead of saying something like, I wanna give everything a final sanity check, you can say, give everything a final check for completeness and clarity. So again, just um, a few considerations here. I will um, share some resources where you can read more about this. Um, so on this slide, it's sort of a mix. So I used a lot of these um, sources today. Some of these are general communication toolkits. So ESAP has a good one. There's a um, paper or um, write up by John Holdren, uh, common pitfalls and mistakes that you may, can make. Um, and then a few memo specific writing uh, resources here from different universities. Uh, I think this Alex, uh, Alex Kaplan, um, write-up is also very helpful. The, um, let's see, um, the link here with uh, Beyond Animal Experimentation, this actually has an example of a memo. So some of these will have instructions as well as examples that you can look at um, for the, from the Broad Institute and the Seattle, um, again, with inclusive language as well. So um, hopefully these will be helpful. I'm happy to send you more, but uh, I think this is a good start with, um, both writing as well as thinking about being inclusive. So um, that's all I had today. I just wanna to leave you with my contact, uh, which you've seen, you already know, I'm on LinkedIn, feel free to connect, I'm on Twitter. 
and as well as JSPG. Um, you can check out our website, um, our newsletter where we post all these events and um, you know, encourage you to submit to JSPG. And we do a lot of um, outreach, obviously that's part of my role um, to elevate the authors and the work through webinars on our podcast. So we just started this podcast a month ago or so where we interview authors. So that's another good opportunity for you to um, highlight your work if you publish in JSPG. And then we're also on Twitter at Cypol Journal. That's it. Thank you.